Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Cass Kasmus, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs like this and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and you would like to join, please email us at dolesab at ku.edu or speak with a student worker like myself after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you are a part of our virtual audience, you may submit your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now, please join me in welcoming Provost Barbara Bickelmeyer. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome here to the Dole Institute. And thank you to all the participants, and notably to General Phil Breedlove, the Supreme Allied Commander for NATO. Recognize tonight that we are here to embark upon and be part of a conference and organizers who have all done great work. And so we want to give a shout out. So let's just take a moment to thank all those who have made this possible. So if you join me. I particularly want to note uh, KU Center for Russia, uh, Russian Eure Eurasian and East European Studies, and KU's Intelligence Community Center for Academic Excellence, and uh, acknowledge again the great um, work that they do for the university, but also the powerful information and education they provide to, uh, to us in our community. The conference that we're engaging in tonight and tomorrow uh, aligns with the university's mission and our strategic plan. The university serves Kansas, the nation, and the world through research and discovery, through education, and through service, and through the preservation and dissemination of knowledge. We educate leaders, we build healthy communities, and we make discoveries that change the world, day in and day out, one event at a time, one participant at a time, one student at a time. Our objective, or one of our institutional objectives under Jayhawks Rising, which is our strategic plan, is to expand the impact of KU research in Kansas and beyond. And this is one of those events that aligns with that kind of a research mission that we have for the university. It also plays to particular research strengths we have, such as safety and security, and also the human experience in the digital age. Through our Research Rising initiative, KU's invested in growing our strength and security, um, for our physical, digital, and social environments. And KU's service to the world also includes the study and research of historical and current conflicts. We hope in order to prevent future war, understand root causes of wars, and the dynamics of violence and strategies for fostering peace. So today's security conference is an example of how higher education examines conflict and post-conflict security from a holistic and multidisciplinary perspective. If we're true to our mission at the University of Kansas and, and think about the role of higher education, we need to acknowledge that we have a responsibility to examine human security issues associated with the Russia and Ukraine war. For example, since the beginning of the conflict in February 2022, an, an estimated 3.7 million people have been driven from their homes and are inter internally uh, displaced and nearly 6.5 million people have crossed into neighboring countries. Those are staggering numbers and Ukraine has become one of the most food insecure countries in the world in that period despite being one of the world's biggest exporters of crops such as maize, barley, and wheat before the war. The Ukrainian landscape has levels of damage that have not been seen in Europe since World War II for which at that time Europe needed 30 years to rebuild. So when the time comes, 
How does the international community prepare for this reconstruction? This is one of the more important questions this conference will be considering. So thank you very much again for participating this evening and in the conference. The thought leadership through this conference and others like it are what we can do at KU to help give society the opportunity to find solutions and express hope for a better future for all. So again, thank you all for participating. And at this point, I, I will hand it over to our, our Director of Graduate Military Programs, Mike Deming, Denning, and to General Breedlove. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Micklemeyer. Um, it is my distinct uh, pleasure at this time to introduce our guest of honor, General Philip Breedlove. General Breedlove served our country as an Air Force fighter pilot for over 39 years. As a four-star general officer, he rose to the highest level of military leadership, and he was one of six geographical combatant commanders, as well as the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. As the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, and the commander of the U.S. European Command. He uh, answered directly to the NATO's governing body, the North Atlantic Council, to the President of the United States, and to the U.S. Secretary of Defense. And during his leadership, NATO underwent some of the most comprehensive and transitional security changes in the Alliance's 70-year history, 75 years history now. General Breedlove uh, earned his undergraduate degree a Bachelor of Civil Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology. He earned two graduate degrees. First of all, a Master's of Science in Aerospace Technology from, Aero, uh, from Arizona State University, as well as a Master's degree in Strategic Studies from the National War College. And he also served at the MIT's Seminar 21 program. General Breedlove is the Chief Executive Officer of Emerald Coast Strategic Solutions, and he currently serves as a distinguished professor in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech, and he is at the Board of Director for the Atlantic Council. Ladies and gentlemen, please greet General Breedlove. <laughs> Sir, welcome to Lawrence. Is this your first time in... Kansas? Not my first time in Kansas. I came to your air base uh, when I was the vice chief of the Air Force, but today when I drove down here from the airport, it was the first time I've really been in Kansas, so it was, <laughs> it was good. And you don't know what rock chalk is yet. <laughs> I don't. No, no. <laughs> we, we will take care of that. I want to, sir, if we can uh, start this evening by, I'd like to get your uh, perspective on the current developments of the war. Okay, so uh, I have some remarks, and I think that's going to take us through this question, and I know you have some more after that. Um, first of all, thanks for coming. I have friends here from Clovis, New Mexico. When I served in Clovis, New Mexico as the commander of the 27th Operations Group there, and it's just really good to see friends who I've worked with uh, and other people other things. It's just really good to be here. I feel like I'm a from among people that I can trust, so tonight, may I just say I'm going to speak very plainly, very plainly, and some of you might not be happy with me, and some of you might be happy with me, but um, ma'am, I would only argue with one thing you said. This war has been going on for 10 years. Russia invaded Ukraine the first two times, when I was the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, the SACUR. And uh, in the interim years, at the line of contact, soldiers were dying every day. And so this war truly has been going on for 10 years. And I think that is important for setting the stage for some of my remarks. I, I need to make the standard declaim, disclaimer. I, I still work a bit for our government, both the Department of State and Department of Defense. I teach at Georgia Tech. And my remarks tonight reflect neither of those organizations. These are my personal thoughts, having served and been in Ukraine many times and getting to know and love the Ukrainian people and what they're trying to do. So, as I said, we are 10 years into an illegal, immoral, and inhumane war. This war is completely contrived. It was built at purpose and started at purpose for Mr. Putin, who wants to change the structure 
of Eastern Europe. Uh, some say he sees himself as Peter the Great and that he has to regrow the Russian Empire. I think if you need to get to sleep some night, there are three documents you might spend a little time with. He wrote a 5,000 word diatribe which is pretty famous where he talked about Ukraine. He never says Ukraine. He says the Ukraine. He says the Crimea because he sees those two entities as a part of Russia. He says the Ukraine like we would say the Midwest or the Southeast. And he never acknowledges that Ukraine is anything but Russia. The other two documents he presented to us about seven days before the war started. I was actually in Kiev, and a small group of ambassadors and one other general and I were there and had meetings with their senior leadership and with uh, the president for a short time. And about the eighth day before the war started, he presented two documents, which he likes to call those two documents. He wanted to call them treaties. We called them documents. We didn't sign them. He said, if you don't sign them, there will be other means. We now understand what that meant. Um, and in those two documents, essentially, and I'm, I'm grossly understating what they said, but essentially they would recreate the Warsaw Pact and the buffer states between Russia and um, um, NATO and it would sort of reset the clock back to before the wall fell. Please, scholars among you, I am understating those documents, but that's pretty close. So Mr. Putin had a view and he started this war to create the view, uh, to affect that view. It had nothing to do with all the things he said to his uh, internal audience and the rest of the war. It's important to note that if you look at those two documents, sadly, we grieve and we, we are trying to help the people of Ukraine and they deserve it, but this is bigger than Ukraine. If you read these documents, Ukraine is step one. And if you really follow what's going on in the news right now, Georgia and Moldova, especially in the Transnistria district, they are under attack as well. Mr. Putin has a plan. He's affecting the plan. Ukraine is the first step. He will not stop at Ukraine. There will be more after that. It's also pretty important to note that as we were talking about really well at dinner, there were a series of sort of misunderstandings and misread leading into this war. And I, I really have a lot of detail I'm not going to cover, but the U.S. and the West really misread Mr. Putin's intentions. If you remember the CNN and the Fox coverage at the time, they were saying that all these battalion task groups on the border were just to put pressure on Zelensky, get Zelensky to come to the table. And we in the West, most of the we in the rest, really didn't think that uh, Mr. Putin would invade. Too much to lose, et cetera, et cetera. Russia completely misread Ukraine. Um, uh, we don't know the exact number, but somewhere between about eight and 10,000 of the Russian troops didn't come over with, their, with their, all of their battle gear with them. They had packed their dress uniforms because they expected to be in a parade four to five days after the war started. And so Ru Russia completely misread the intentions, the will, and the preparation of the Ukrainian people. And then as President Zelensky admonished our small group when we were there for the visit, the entire world was not watching what was going on in Ukraine. The gray zone battles that were happening there, the assaults on the electrical grid, the transportation grid, down to things as, as ugly as threatening schools and school buses so that mothers would lose faith in putting their kids in the schools. Russia was attacking across the entire gamut of national power to disrupt and uh, tear apart Ukraine. And all the time that our eyes were off of Ukraine, 
and maybe thankfully that Russia's eyes were off Ukraine. Ukraine had been preparing what soldiers in America call an incredible defense in depth. And we saw that defense in depth play out in the front of the war where about 30 days into Russia's attack, Ukraine literally strategically defeated Russia on the north side of Kiev and on the north and northwest side of Kharkiv. And that defense in depth that had been prepared played out in a wonderful way in the defense of uh, Ukraine. Here's where I'm going to lose a few of you. But I really believe this. We in the world now are suffering, I believe, from a series of misjudgments and missteps by the West. And when I say the West, that certainly includes the United States. The first, I believe, is that in 2008, when Russia invaded Georgia, now there was a lot of things that happened in the run-up to that war, but when Russia amassed its army and walked across an internationally recognized border, invaded and subjugated 20% of Georgia, I offer to you that the response of the West was inadequate to task. And in the end, we rewarded bad behavior by allowing Russia to hold on to 20% of Georgia. In 2013 and 2014, Russia once again amassed its land army, marched across an internationally recognized border, invaded and subjugated about 12 to 13 percent of the nation of Ukraine. And may I add that 12 to 13 percent was some of the most important to agricultural trade and other technical trades when, when Russia took Mariupol off the map, essentially reduced it to rubble, and when they officially took over the Sevastopol, the naval base, that was a big impact, even though it was only 12%. Once again, once again, it is my assertion that the West's response was inadequate to task, and we, for the second time, rewarded bad behavior by allowing Mr. Putin to hold on to those parts of Ukraine. We find ourselves now in 2024, and Already, we see that the West is taking steps to try to appease Russia, give them more land for peace. And so, in the end, in another whenever, however many months, you're going to hear Phil Breedlove saying, in 2024, our response was inadequate to task, and we once again rewarded bad behavior of Russia by giving them land. Now, I'm a father of three, and I'm a proud grandfather of three. And here's what I know from raising children. Mostly watching my wife, but here's what I know. <laughs> here's what I know. If you reward bad behavior, and you reward bad behavior, and you reward bad behavior, you're going to get more bad behavior. You're not going to get good behavior. And so... I believe that we are at a point where we're going to have to make a decision about how we react to Mr. Putin this time. Or we're going to see it in 2027, 2030, 2033, and he will execute the plan which he wrote us. You can read it, you can Google it, and he's going to execute that plan. Uh, because of the sort of Chatham House rules, in the agreement, we talk about not giving away names. I won't give away names, but I heard a very senior individual in our government say recently that Mr. Putin will not stop. Mr. Putin will have to be stopped. Our primary tool of dealing with Russia to this point uh, in all of these conflicts have been sanctions. Now, at Georgia Tech, we keep things real simple in our school. 
we talk about a nation's powers as we used to actually carry coins in our pocket. You remember those days? And one of them was a dime, D-I-M-E. And I use that as the model because knuckle dragon fighter pilots need a simple model. So diplomatic power, informational and intelligence power, military power, and economic power. When Russia attacks, they use all the tools that a nation has in their gray zone war. When we respond to Russia, what do we use? Sanctions. <clears throat> hard sanctions. Special sanctions. Extra special hard sanctions. <laughs> Supercalifragilistic expialidocious sanctions. And then double sanctions. Uh, I can't remember those words from Animal House, but there was something in there that I, I should probably use. But the, I'm making a little fun here in that when Russia attacks, they use all elements of power, and we could walk through how they did that in Ukraine, in Georgia, and how they're doing it in Moldova now. When we respond, we only respond in the economic power, and I think that we're going to have to rethink how we do that. Sanctions have hurt Russia, sanctions have hurt the Russian people, sanctions have hurt Russia's standing in the world, but I will, I will uh, gladly share a drink with anybody back there that can convince me that sanctions have ever changed Mr. Putin's actions. They have not. And so I think we're going to have to think beyond just sanctions to address Mr. Putin. Okay, so I'm going to race through answering your question now, and then we'll get to questions here in a little bit. Where are we now? Um, as I mentioned before, at the beginning of this uh, portion of the 10-year war, uh, when Russia raced in and grabbed almost 46% of the landmass of, um, of Ukraine, when the defense in depth started acting on the Russian forces, there was a strategic defeat of North uh, Russia north of Kiev, as I said, a strategic defeat of Russia north and northwest of Kharkiv, and uh, we were in sort of an operational level uh, offensive program in the south, not a strategic one, but there was some progress in the south. That war has, as you have watched, changed into an attritional, almost World War I style of static trench warfare that is just chewing up lives at a rate that's unimaginable. Artillery is pretty much the maneuver element of Russia. Now, both sides are beginning to change that dynamic with drones, and we can talk about that in the questions if you want. Russia's primary target, targeting for the first uh, 16, 18 months of this iteration was counter-civilian and civilian targeting. Uh, look at what happened in Mariupol. It's just gross what happened there. Moscow has proven unable to conduct maneuver warfare, combined arms warfare, and do the Air Force's missions. They have done very poorly at it. And while we, we grieve and love and, and pray for the Ukrainian people, they're putting up a brave face, but they are in an incredibly tough place right now. They're still severely outgunned. And, uh, and may I just observe that we in the West are slow leaking their support at purpose. At purpose, we're doing that. And right now, both sides are having horrible uh, loss rates. So I'm asked at almost every one of these, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and answer it ahead of time here. So what happens next? Where are we going from here? These are my observations. There are a lot of people who share me in these, share with me in these three operations or observations. And each one of them, I think, provides us with something that we need to look at the Western series of nations to correct. So I believe there are three paths forward. The first one is if Western support wanes or stops, Ukraine will fight on for a long time. 
Tens of thousands more will die and they will lose and they will be subjugated by Russia and the Ukrainian culture, the Ukrainian language and Ukraine will, will be put under severe stress in that future. The second opportunity is the tough one and that is that we don't change anything we're doing right now. Again, some of you may have questions for me on this, but my interpretation of what we're doing for Ukraine right now is giving them enough to remain viable on the battlefield, but at purpose and decidedly not giving them what they need to win. And so if we continue to do that, why? And most people will explain that they want to see Ukraine go to the table and develop some amount of appeasement, give Russia more land, and get peace. Which is what we've done twice in the past, and it hasn't worked yet, but that's what it appears we're trying to do. One ask, would ask, why would we do that? And uh, my opinion is that we will... We are unable to intellectually uh, work out in how to deal with a defeated Putin or a defeated Russia. We told Russia what we were afraid of at the beginning of this war. We were afraid of tactical nuclear weapons and we were afraid of a widening war. Mr. Putin plays those themes back to us. On about uh, every six to eight days, someone in the senior nu uh, Russian uh, works talks about nukes on an average of every 10 to 12 days someone in the senior Russian uh, ranks talks about the war will widen and about 50% of the time that they talk about the war will widen they add the extra caveat of of course and once again American soldiers will die on the battlefields of Europe and so we are deterred this is a word we use in the military we are deterred, and I do not think that we, uh, we in the West, and certainly we inside of our country, we are unable to intellectually do what um, Kennedy did in the Cuban Missile Crisis and stand up, uh, or to do what Reagan did in the intermediate uh, range nuclear missile crisis of early NATO and stand up. We are unable to get to that point now, and so I think that's why we are at purpose, not giving uh, Ukraine what they need to win. The third option is that we give Ukraine what they need to win. Like we did it for about three months at the beginning of this war, and you saw Ukraine strategically defeat uh, Russia in the north part of uh, Ukraine. I believe that given the right equipment, Ukraine could expel Russia from their lands and then we would have to deal with a defeated Putin and a defeated Russia. And we have to be intellectually honest and say that we don't have a crystal ball and we don't really know if we know what we know about what he would do. So this, there is no zero risk way ahead. I'm pretty sure that's what they told Kennedy and I'm pretty sure that's what they told Reagan. So three options, we stop their support, they lose. We keep doing what we're doing now, they eventually lose. Or we give them what they need and they win. So minus policy changes, a few things that I would say about where we, what we should do in the next 12 months. The first one is stop doing what I've been doing for almost 15 minutes here and that is all the doom saying. Ukraine is actually doing pretty well. Let's recount a few things. Ukraine, a country that we were party to disarming in 1994 as a part of the Budapest Agreement, Ukraine by itself, manpower-wise, has stood up to a world superpower now for 10 years. That's not a small accomplishment. They have imposed on Russia... I'll give you the range. I don't think either number is right. I think it's somewhere in the middle. But Russia has had between three 
150,000 casualties and 500,000 casualties. I think the number's in there in the middle a little bit. How many did we have in Vietnam? 58,220 is one of the numbers we use. Think about what 350,000 casualties means to a nation. Uh, Russia held at one point about 48% of Ukraine. They only hold 20% of it now. Russia has not, quote unquote, knocked out Ukraine as they said they would. Actually, Ukraine has won the battle, the naval battle of the North Sea, and they don't have a single capital ship. Not one. And they've won the battle of the North Sea. And the, the Russian Federation Air Force has not done what an Air Force needs to done, do for its nation. So I would just say that we, we're often being critical of where Ukraine is and what they're doing. And frankly, they haven't done so bad. I think we need to set and support Ukraine's priorities, keep pressure on Crimea. I think we need to, even though it's going to cost us in pricing, we need to keep pressure on the Russian petrochemical. They started importing oil today or two days ago. Not oil, refined gas, because the, the Ukrainians have been hitting their refineries. Um, so that's pretty good. We need to stabilize the front. And we need to uh, get on our own nation and the other nations of the West about our industrial capacity to surge to support. Um, we have, for a lot of right reasons, controlled our industries to a point where they had almost zero surge capacity. And another one that is controversial. Uh, we studied the, what call, we call the old dead guys in war college, Clausewitz, Jomini, and Sun Tzu. And they all spoke different languages, so the words are not perfect. But all three of them in one manner or another say the following, and that is that the enemy gets a vote. In America, when we talk about Russia, we talk about being in a, a competition with Russia. In Russia, when they talk about America, they're at war with Russia, or with America. Russia's at war with America. Um, the enemy gets a vote. And in my last testimony in Congress, I told one of the congressional members, I said, sir, in my opinion, if we're competing with Russia and they're fighting with us, we're losing. It's an attitude thing. We're going to have to sort out and get some strategic clarity, I believe, in where we are in this business. I'll close with the following. Um, people ask me all the time, what do we need to give Ukraine? And in their mind, it's a, some shiny object. It was tanks. It was Javelin missiles. It, it was uh, coastal defense cruise missiles. It was the F-16, an airplane I love. And I, I never participate in the game of what I call shiny objects. When, when I'm asked what we need to give Ukraine, I answer in the following way. We need to give Ukraine a clear declaratory policy of what we're about in Ukraine. If, if you uh, go back and read what our government wrote... Um, they, they have a statement they, they use that our current U.S. desired outcome is a sovereign, independent, democratic, and viable Ukraine. When pressed on what viable means, they, they think of viable as whatever is left and not taken by Russia, we make that viable as opposed to regaining the land that Russia has taken. I think that's a problem. But if you ask the standard kids on a campus uh, what, what our policy is, most of them will tell you the two sentences 
that our most senior leadership used often. They don't use it so much anymore. But they say about Ukraine, we will be there as long as it takes and we're going to give them everything they need. Now to the men and some women in this audience who've been a military planner or commander and you're told we're going to be there as long as it takes, do you have what you need to plan for your action? No. We're going to, we're going to give them everything they need. Does that tell you what you need to give Ukraine? No, those are incomplete sentences. We're going to be there as long as it takes to do what? We're going to give them everything they need to do what? Now I'm going to be flipping. Are we throwing a birthday party? Are we going across the river and regaining part of a province? Or are we doing what the Ukrainian people want to do, which is regain all their sovereign territory and reestablish the sovereign international borders of Ukraine. And that includes Crimea, oh, by the way. So I think that the most important thing that we owe Ukraine now, or the most important thing we could, quote, unquote, give Ukraine right now, doesn't cost a dime. It really is an expression of our commitment to what their future is. We owe them a publicly acknowledge declaratory policy about what we intend to do for Ukraine in a war against a world superpower. Thanks for listening. Thank you, sir. Um, and, and I would say you do paint a more positive uh, landscape than I think many of us uh, ex ex expected. Uh, I am curious about one thing. You, you talked about the third option, and that is we give, uh, we give Zelensky what he needs, and, and they win. What is it that causes Putin to stop? <coughs> uh, I will use words that I have stolen or, or plagiarized from others, and I usually acknowledge, and that is that, um, remember, we talked about Mr. Putin will not stop. He has to be stopped. And a lot of people say Putin will never stop until he runs into iron, meaning force. Mr. Putin understands force. Now, I think that I was very critical about sanctions haven't worked. I think that we might actually be in a place where I'm proven wrong because what we see now is sanctions are not really affecting Mr. Putin. But it, uh, the Russian scholars in here will tell you there's about two levels of, uh, most people call them autocrats, I call them kleptocrats, um, who are just below Mr. Putin. And some of those are new kleptocrats who are completely dependent on Mr. Putin for their income. There's a thicker layer of those below him who are old kleptocrats who have old money and a lot of that old money is out in the world now and might go away if the, if the world decides to seize it and use it to support Ukraine. And what I think we're actually seeing after I've been so critical of we only do sanctions, we might actually be at a point where we start to see some fracturing. We used to think that was impossible. And, and then we saw Mr. Prigozhin and and his forces actually march on the capital for a little while. I think that we don't understand those two layers of kleptocrats that are, that are, that are the power structure below Mr. Putin. And um, I, I see people who I trust. I'm not an economist. I see people who I trust who are actually saying that we're starting to see some fracturing in that support base. So he could be stopped either by iron or certainly if his support base begins to seriously unravel, that might stop him. Okay. Uh, there are real Russian experts in this crowd who might have a better answer, but that would be my answer. Thanks, sir. Um, I'm going to ask one more, and then we'll turn it over to the, uh, to the audience for question and answers. Um, you know, looking at some favorable uh, positions, eight months ago, uh, there were a lot of people that thought uh, the offensive 
was going to be uh, favorable. Um, NATO had provided uh, some training and equipment, and much of the analysts' expectations were there was going to be a breakthrough. Why, why did that not happen? So I, I have I have two answers to this, and uh, and one is a bit complimentary, uh, not complimentary, but it's it's uh, it's supportive. The other is not supportive. So we had a uh, we had a we had a time where we were training um, Ukraine to fight what we call modern maneuver mm -hmm. warfare, operational uh, maneuver on the battlefield, and we were trying to train them to do that. And they failed at that. Mm -hmm. And people were screaming in the press, why are they not doing what we train them to do? Um, you and I know, and there's a few other folks in here I could point at that know that in modern battle, the first thing you have to establish to do maneuver warfare is air superiority, at least local air superiority over the battlefield, okay? And um, we have not given Ukraine what they need. You cannot do maneuver warfare when you're completely exposed to air attack. And so uh, we have not given Ukraine the ability to create um, battlefield air superiority. And so they fought the fight that they could fight, which is based on artillery, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, they, did not, uh, they did not, quote, unquote, succeed at that. I would just say that um, even Avdivka and Bakhmut the first time around, these are seen as... Uh, tactical defeats for Ukraine. But um, if you look at the loss ratio of soldiers that Russia lost in those two battles, you might change your mind on what the outcome was. It's a horrible, horrible thing to think. But Russia threw bodies at those two fights in a way that is we would never do in the West. We would never do that. Um, so... And with that, we will uh, turn it over now to uh, questions and answers. We've got students that have uh, microphones that will bring it to individuals. One thing, uh, when the students come, they're actually going to maintain a uh, close, uh, tight grip on the uh, microphone, so no rustling. And again, uh, please uh, form it in a question and not too long. Uh, all the way in the back. Um, hello, thank you for your talk. Now, uh, one of the key questions which many experts ra raise is U.S. relations with uh, quote-unquote unsupportive allies like Turkey, Hungary, and to lesser extent Slovakia, which loyalties lie somewhere in the middle, but which we have to agree on in any NATO decisions. So obviously, as a NATO general, you had experience dealing with their governments, uh, what would you say from your experience are the most efficient ways to deal with these unsupportive allies to make them support what NATO and US and the rest of the allies want them to do? So this is a really good question. And uh, as the SACUR, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, you're far less a commander, you're far more a diplomat at the military level. Um, I had almost seven four-star generals working for me who got to do all the fun things, and I had to put together the support for all the things they wanted to do. And this is important to your question in that um, when, when NATO comes to a tough decision, it very rarely does anything fast. I, I often used to say, because there were only 28 nations in NATO when I was the SAC year, and I used to say it's like making soup. We have 28 ingredients, and it always doesn't work well together in the beginning, but in the end it's fairly satisfying and we get the <laughs> job done. To your very specific question, though, I would just point out, and I, I need to not use the names, but you'll probably figure it out. Um, at the Wales summit, right after the invasion of, um, of Ukraine, the first two invasions, 
in, the, in Crimea and in Donbass. Um, we had the Wales Summit and we made the biggest changes to NATO force structure and readiness in the history of NATO. Now they have gone beyond us now, but we made big changes. At that conference there were uh, three um, nations that voted to basically nix everything we wanted to do. And what I saw was one of the ambassadors uh, from one of the older NATO nations asked for a short recess everybody to get coffee and during that recess there were a couple of small groups of people on the side of the big Mac North Atlantic Council room and they were dealing with those three nations and two of the nations caved immediately I can't tell you what was said in those conversations but I can only guess, um, that uh, did not resolve all three. And um, uh, we had another series of discussions and then one of the big and old NATO nations asked for another recess. And then um, five of the largest and oldest NATO nations had a short meeting on the side with the recalcitrant nation. I was there because my leader asked me to be there and I can tell you that they dealt with it and we had another vote and we had 28 ingredients in the soup. So in the end I would offer to you that NATO has its own way with dealing with these things all nations come into NATO seeking to get something from NATO. That becomes a fungible tool uh, in these sort of intense conversations. And by the end of that conference, the Wales conference, we had 28 ingredients in the soup and we moved out. Now that's a very simplistic way of talking about how it works, but it's literally politics at the very highest level when people are, are hard pressed to move forward. It was clear to almost every nation in NATO that we had to do something to be more ready for Mr. Putin. He had three times marched his army across an internationally recognized border and since World War II we thought that was over. I hope that answered your question. Right here. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Uh, does Putin have the resources to continue uh, his, his, what amounts to an aggression? Uh, he's got to be losing numbers of troops and probably some equipment. Uh, can he sustain this for a long time? Um, I, would, I would answer your question by being comparative. He can stay at it longer than Ukraine can stay at it. Uh, the uh, depth of magazine, if you'll allow me to use that word, more kit and more people in Russia than in Ukraine. Um, but, but you're on to something in that even for Russia, this has become problematic. Um, they are putting in the battle these days, refurbished T-62s. Um, they're, they're, they have gone through most of their good kit. Some, uh, an army officer in the crowd, tell me the two proudest, biggest U.S. Army formations. 101st Airborne Division, the Thank you. Yeah, somebody ought to at least throw in their big red one so we can talk about tanks. <laughs> So if you pick two of those, if you pick two of those formations, their equivalent in Russia is gone. Gone. Now they've reconstituted one of them with a completely different Cold War era set of old tanks and, uh, and they have leadership and soldiers who have never done anything together but they're standing in formation. 
And that's not an army fighting unit, is it? No. And so uh, Russia's, they, their first guards tank army. Anybody know what their mission was? Defending Moscow. It's gone. Okay? They have really taken a hit. But they have the wherewithal to reconstitute that Ukraine doesn't. So it's not about, they're taking huge losses, but they can sustain it longer than Ukraine can, in my opinion. Back over there, far left. There's one over here, too. Okay. Sorry. Um, I ask this as an ethnic Ukrainian who has grown up in America and has witnessed the Euromaidan when I was probably about six or seven, not in, um, obviously on TV, but I ask this, how close is the U.S. to an actual military conflict with Russia? And furthermore, how close is NATO? It's a really good question, and it's the question that Mr. Putin wants us to worry about. He wants to feed our fear of a war. And we are afraid of a war. I, my daughter and my son-in-law wear the uniform of this country. I don't want them to have to go to the wars like I had to. Um, but we cannot, I think, allow our fear to completely eliminate response in all manner. Again, I think that President Kennedy faced a pretty tough, tough problem. He chose to stand up against his fears and take some risk. We mentioned before, there are no zero risk ways ahead, none. Um, and and uh, fewer people understand the decisions that Reagan made during the intermediate uh, range nuclear missile crisis in, in Europe, but he stood up to a similar problem. And so um, the answer, I think, is not uh, to capitulate. It's got to be something else. And so, yes, as I said before, intellectually we have to, ad we have to acknowledge that we cannot know that there is going to be no conflict. But if we back up, we can back up until we hit the water, okay, and then we've got to do something. So, Does the introduction of NATO forces trigger a, any chance of a nuclear action by Putin? So I, I, um, I would... I would have asked me that question different. Okay. <laughs> but, but no, I, the, I'm trying to say in a nice way, Mr. Putin wants us to ask about nukes all the time. He wants us focused on nukes. Right. Nukes, 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 nukes. Every six to eight days, somebody talks about nukes. We're abrogating this. We're doing that. We just built this. We're testing this new nuke. It's nukes, 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 nukes all the time. Um, I'm much more fearful of the war becoming wider. Mm -hmm. Mr. Putin, his troops do not know how to fight in a nuclear environment. Ours only practice it very little. Mm -hmm. You know, MOP4 mm -hmm. and NBC right. and all of that. We do it. Very few nations do it. And we're not good at it. And I know they're not good at it. They went, when they went in this war, they had uh, a whole battalion dig foxholes around Chernobyl, and they were all exposed to radiation. They have no idea how to deal with it. So I don't know that Mr. Putin really wants to use nukes on a battlefield, but he definitely wants us to think he will. I'm, I'm more fearful of him breaking out in Moldova. Um, our policy, spoken policy, has been very clear over and over. We have said we will defend every inch of NATO. And I think Mr. Putin actually understands that. But I think what he also hears when we say that is 
Outside of NATO, not so much. And that's why he's active in Georgia again. That's why he's active in Moldova again. And I think that to show his internal audience that he is the war-fighting hero of Russia, I'm more fearful that he will break out in some of these non-NATO nations that are, because they are not one of the inches of NATO. Right here. This gentleman's been trying for a long yep. time over here. Oh, sure. I'll stand. Um, so my question is, um, so obviously there's that the Russian use of um, like the fear of nuclear ex um, escalation as like a deterrent for the United States. Um, my question is obviously with um, United States funding going also now to Israel, are they using like United States pragmatism as a possible, um, a, you know, with discussions of continuing funding for Ukraine? Could Russia also be relying on United States backing down in terms of funding for Ukraine as um, a potential win, um, window of opportunity for them to win the conflict in Ukraine? So it's a very good question, and I think the easy answer is yes, I believe it's all connected. Mr. Putin sees a window of opportunity when we are quote unquote distracted. Uh, and I think Mr. Putin loves us worrying about China as much as we do, which is appropriate. Okay, I'm not criticizing that, but I, I think Mr. Putin um, is very aware of that as, as helping his situation. Um, I'm going to answer another question that yours triggered because I just want to say this. I actually cut it out of my remarks, but let's go ahead and go for it. When, when um, I'm, I'm asked occasionally, what is China learning from Ukraine? And, uh, and the really smart China thinkers have actually put some things forward that are pretty interesting. You know, Russia has had a really hard time invading Ukraine. So I think that China may be rethinking whether they actually want to land on the shores of Taiwan. And uh, they may have adapted a new uh, posture that we saw a foretelling of when our Speaker of the House went over to Taiwan. We saw this amazing blockade, air, land, and sea, or air and sea, of Taiwan. And they may be rethinking that. I do know that we've seen indications that several weapons that uh, China had bought from Ukraine or from Russia are not working very well for Russia right now. The highly vaunted S-400 hasn't shot down an ATACMS yet, and it was built to shoot down the ATACMS. So I think China is having some issues there. But more importantly, here's what I think. People ask me, well, what's our Taiwan... Uh, policy and what's our North Korea policy and what's our Iran policy and how is it being affected by Ukraine and I tell them this again this is Phil Breedlove nobody around me but I, I often answer that question by saying we have written policies and we have spoken policies I don't think they mean very much right now because our policy for Taiwan and our policy for Iran and our policy for North Korea, they are all being written in Ukraine right now. Remember when your mother once said to you, it, it doesn't matter, people are not watching what you say or listening, or listening to what you say or watching what you write or anything like that. They watch what you do, okay? And so I really believe that the world is watching how the West handles Ukraine and our true policies in these other places in their minds are adapting. Right here in the front. This is a question about the economic impact on military capability. When we talk about 350,000 casualties, what kind of an economic multiplier effect does that have on Putin's ability to wage this kind of war? Because that has an overall economic 
arc? Um, I would, I would, uh, I agree that it's economic. Let me answer your question by saying they are having shortages in their factories of young men. They're still pretty heavily male dominated in there, but um, they are having trouble manning some of their manufacturing processes because two things, they've lost soldiers and a lot of young men left Russia when they started to have their first draft. So that was a little bit more of a brain drain and now they're, you, they're losing some of their just plain industrial cap capability because their uh, losses are so high. So uh, I don't, I have no way of quantifying, I don't know what the numbers are, but we see really smart people writing now a lot about the impact on industrial capacity because of the lack of manning. First of all, on behalf of Ukrainians, I would like to say thank you for telling the truth. People need to know this, and people need to hear this, especially in the West. Uh, my question is, you told about those three scenarios, and we definitely know them. Uh, first of all, I would say that second, it's not optional for us. We will fight till our final breath. First, it's possible. Again, we will fight to the end, and we will never um, give up from our land because that is our home. So, but talking about the third one, don't you think it's too late to give everything what we need? Because since West was thinking, should we give or not, a lot of equipment and different support, Russia built all this defense, and um, now it's getting so hard to go through that. So what do you think, is it possible still, really, for us to win? Thank you. It is. I absolutely believe it. Um, this is going to sound really smug because I'm an Air Force officer. I served in the Army. I'm, I served with 2nd Brigade, 3rd ID. I'm a Marn man, as we say. And I highly respect our ground forces. But let me tell you that all of those defenses you're talking about in that forward area would not survive modern air power. And when I say air power, it's way more than the U.S. Air Force. It's all the services. It's a, a lot of attack helicopters. Trench warfare will not survive in the face of, two, of true air capability, bigger than U.S. Air Force air capability. So I, I do not believe it's too late. What I do believe is um, that sometime in the future, history is going to grade us poorly for how many Ukrainian people and how many Ukrainian soldiers have died. If we had taken some of the actions that were proposed even before this latest two-year portion of this war started, this would be a very different fight right now extremely different. We, we chose not to take a lot of those actions because we thought they were too provocative and they would cause the Russians to attack. Well, we didn't take the actions and Russia attacked. So we'll never know what those precautionary measures might have been able to do because we were unable to take the decision. But I, I am, uh, there are people in this audience who've traveled in Ukraine a lot more than me. I've been there a lot. And I've talked to a lot of Ukrainian soldiers. And the fighting spirit of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian soldiers, if we give them what they need, they'll take care of business. Remember, 10 years they've been fighting a world superpower. 10 years they've been fighting a world superpower. I'm pretty, uh, I remain optimistic that if we could just make the decisions that we could not use a single American soldier and that they would do just fine. That's my opinion. Right here.
while, he, while he's getting the question, I, I, I mean, I should have said up front, you know I can't be unbiased. <laughs> I served eight times in Europe during the Cold War and just after the Cold War. I stood in, on the inter-German border for years and looked at the Russians. I, I uh, have served later in my life as the commander of NATO. I cannot be unbiased here, so you all need to understand who you're listening to when I answer these questions. So we thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. So in your opinion, what do you think the probability is that the United States and or the United Nations will provide Ukraine with whatever they need to end the war? 100% sure the United Nations will not provide that. 100% sure. Um, I think, though, that at some point, the United Nations may become involved in all the war crimes. I mean, this is an army. The Russian army has weaponized murder, the slit trenches in Busha and other or places in the northwest. We saw murder, not the casualties of war. They have weaponized rape. You have seen the letters from mothers and, and wives telling their soldiers it's okay to rape Ukrainian women. They have weaponized torture, and the sad news is in some of the places we uncovered in the southeast, they found torture chambers which were made for smaller bodies, yeah. a.k.a. children. Um, and we've seen the systematic um, uh, kidnapping and deportation of children. This is why the world court has indicted Putin, because... He isn't denying what they're doing. He has a minister that brags about how many thousands of, soul, of children she has repatriated to the Slavic race in motherland Russia. And so, you know, this is horrible. At some point, maybe the UN will take that on, but I do not believe they will ever take. The, just the Security Council veto by Russia will stop any actions that, that would, the UN would take on. Now, the real question is, will the West come to this decision? And um, three weeks ago, I ha would have been skeptical. And then I listened to President Macron make some of the most amazing statements mm -hmm. I've ever heard from a French president. And uh, we actually, he actually has, he has interjected some spirit into the conversation that we haven't seen. And so uh, at this point, I don't know what NATO might choose to do. Um, I'm almost more worried about our nation in this upcoming election than I am what the rest of NATO, because NATO is, may I just say to you, if you don't know, in, in per uh, capita, or excuse me, in per GDP, basis, the United States is 13th in the list of people giving stuff to Ukraine. 12 nations on a per GDP basis give more than we do. And uh, at this point, um, at this point, uh, Europe is giving 52% and we're giving 48% of the, of the donations, not donations, but the contributions to Ukraine. That's going to change fairly rapidly because, as you know, we haven't resolved whether we're going to give any at all this year. And so um, the, uh, that number will start to shift more and more in Europe's favor as they give. And I think you probably saw also that uh, Jen Stoltenberg, who was brand new when I was the SACUR, he was the brand new uh, Secretary General, he's just uh, announced a push that's getting pretty good support to establish a hundred billion dollar fund out of NATO nations for Ukraine. So I see NATO moving in the right direction. I'm a little worried about our country. I don't think the UN's ever going to step up and be a fighting force or a fighting capability. Right here. 
given the recent addition of uh, Finland to NATO um, and Putin essentially doing nothing but talking, um, is that kind of indicative of whether or not Putin will actually take action if NATO were to advance further east in defense? So Finland and Sweden now joining. And oh, by the way, if you ask the Finns, they won the Winter War. <laughs> and so they, have, they know a little bit about fighting Russia. Um, I think the Im impactful part of that is Mr. Putin tries to convince at least the people inside his country that this war is because of NATO's expansion to the east. Um, and uh, I would offer that um, the idea he likes to push, which is NATO's out there trying to grab these nations and pull them into NATO, that's as far from the truth as you can ever imagine. Having sat in the meetings where we talked about the open door policy at the summit and at the every year meetings of the uh, deaf men's and four men's, um, it's very clear to me that there are nations that are now in who for over 25 years were trying to get in. They're begging and clawing and grabbing and trying to get in NATO. NATO is not out there trying to pull them in to encroach on Russia. And why are they doing that? Well, some of them, like the Baltic nations, have had to win their independence from Russia twice. Okay, They don't want to have to do it a third time. And so uh, these are um, uh, the, the idea that uh, NATO is encroaching on Russia to me is, is not, doesn't hold water. Right here. Uh, <clears throat> You talked earlier about before the, the I guess, formal invasion of Ukraine by regular Russian forces that Putin was using all three uh, types of warfare. Uh, right now, we have a long, I'm going beyond Ukraine into the West and the countries supporting Ukraine. Uh, we know that Putin is very active in information, disinformation, uh, handing out uh, money to generally right-wing politicians, but I don't think that he's got any ideology, ideological affiliations. But uh, Soviet or Russian agents putting in disinformation, trying to discredit politicians, uh, making loans to try and help politicians. Do you think that we have a robust enough response to that? Are, we, are there people who are stepping up our, our defenses and trying to identify where this money is coming from when it can be routed easily through the Caribbean, through the Isle of Man, through all sorts of different accounts? No. I'm going to answer. I just wanted to be funny. Um, but the answer is no. We, we, um, we already know, I mean, we know for a fact that Mr. Putin was in our last election. Now, I happen to be in a small group of people that uh, didn't believe he was trying to pick a winner, that what he really wanted to do was make Americans lose confidence in our electoral system. And I think he succeeded wildly. I think they were injecting information on both sides of the argument. It may have been heavier on one than the other, but there were attacks into both sides of, of the argument uh, in the last elections here. And that's what we saw in France as well in the Marine Le Pen um, um, election, uh, that, that they were attacking both sides of the argument trying to create um, um, dissension and untrust, lack of trust. Um, but if you look at and read the, the people who watch this closely, and some of those are three-digit alphabet soup uh, um, organizations, uh, they, they tell us that 
It's going to be worse this time around than last time around. Um, social media is an incredible tool for those who choose to abuse it. Um, and um, uh, we, we actually uh, have a class at Georgia Tech where we teach people how to understand how we call it the yak back affects you, how it learns who you are and it yaks back to you what you want. We do an experiment on a paper where we uh, have a very liberal person do 100% Google searching on a subject and then we get a, we don't have a very many really uh, conservative, but we do have some conservative folks as well. We have them do the same work and it's amazing how different the results are and the yak back is yakking back what it thinks you know and want to know and the people that abuse that and how they abuse it is quite demonstrative and our three digit agencies tell us about ways to be untrustworthy if you read something on your machine that just absolutely incenses you <laughs> pretty good chance that it's not coming from a reputable source Okay, um, when I was the SACUR, there were a lot of things written about me. You can still read them. There, <laughs> a couple of them, if you Google me, talk about how I tried to overthrow the Obama government. <laughs> Colin Powell and I, he was a mentor of mine, and how he and I were trying to overthrow the Obama government. Um, these, these. Uh, the, all of the articles that were being written, they, the, the people who know what they're doing told us it's really two guys, the diction, sentence structure, and all these things. We don't know who they are, but we know what part of Russia they came from. They're both working in the Wacko farm in St. Petersburg where they turn all this stuff out. And so we understand that Russia is going to be in our systems and pushing our buttons and how we fight it, I think, is your question. And are we fighting it? I don't think we are. Um, we're trying to educate people to how to, re to see, understand, and, uh, and then try to get past um, this. For the educators in the room, we did an experiment. We, we called students in at the senior levels and asked them to bring a paper they had written the year before. And we opened to their bibliography. And then we put up on the, on the stage a uh, picture. It was two, two pages of uh, liberal sources and about a page of, uh, of conservative sources. And we graded the bibliographies. And there was well above a 90% correlation. You know, you could read a bibliography and say, okay, this is a conservative student. This is a, um, a, a liberal student. And we asked them how they did their, their research, and they, they Googled. And the yak back knows who they are and what they want to hear, and the yak back's going to give them exactly what they want yak back to them. And so we're trying to teach them that we believe that liberal arts is a study of all views to come to thought process that can forward our society not just those views or just those views. And that's what yakbacks do to you. If you don't learn a discipline for forcing yourself how to do business. There's some pretty good sources out there that will, uh, uh, some of them you have to pay for, but when every day you get five or six subject matters and you'll get a left and right. And we're encouraging our kids to read left and right. One young lady who I absolutely love, she just graduated last year. In her sophomore year, she said, Sir, why would I ever read anything conservative? They're all wrong. <laughs> and I, I'm like, okay, let's, let's go back to what liberal arts is. And so we're, we're, we're trying to make a dent. But you're asking, are we prepared to fight this fight? No, sir. We're not prepared to fight this fight. Adrian? Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, 
not sure where to start here, but I think when I listen to general officers, McCaffrey, Petraeus, talk about this war, that they grossly underestimate the Russians, that you have given the casualty figures for the Russians, but you haven't said that the Ukrainians have lost just as many people. The Russians built artillery rounds 10 times faster than we do. They have more tubes than we do. The Russians are on the offensive. I said a year ago that Russia is not going to be defeated. Another $60 billion is not going to cause that situation to change. M1 Abrams main battle tanks and F-16s are not going to change the dynamic on that battlefield. Russia is not going to be defeated. Russia is on the offensive. They own 20 percent of Ukrainian territory. They're taking more of that territory. And when this thing is over with, Russia will own more of Ukraine. So my argument has been that Ukraine ought to be seeking peace at this moment, not not trying to amplify this thing because the Russians are, at this time, as we sit here in this room, they're on the offensive, and that will continue. Um, again, I, uh, I, I know there's this wishful thinking that this country seems to generate that comes out of Afghanistan and Iraq, two other disasters uh, that we uh, carried out, but I disagree with your assessment about the outcome of, of this. And, well, I, we I can, absolutely, I absolutely respect your your opinion, and part of my part of my paper, uh, I actually acknowledge that Ukraine has lost almost the same. And as I said to the uh, young lady over here, Russia has more, and that's why if we keep doing what we're doing now, Ukraine will eventually be subjugated because they don't have the depth that Russia has. Um, I agree, they have 20% now. They had 48% a few months back, about a year ago, and Ukraine has taken back most of that. I, I, don't, uh, I do believe that Russia, in the, again now in the um, central western Donbass, they're on the offense, but they're not on the offense in the south. They're not on the offense in the north. I, I mean, these are, you're an army guy, you know this better than me, but... I think that, I think that um, again, I, I don't like the doom saying because I, Ukraine all by itself, as far as manpower, has stood up to Russia now for 10 years. I think that's frankly pretty impressive. Um, I, I also would like to add, I didn't talk about it earlier, we have so hamstrung Ukraine it's just really crazy. Uh, Lloyd Austin, the secretary, is a good friend of mine. We served together as combatant commanders when he was still in um, uniform. And I, I talked to um, um, several people about the sanctuary that we have created for Russia. So f some of you in the audience may not know, but, but um, for this entire war, for 10 years, we have... We have forbidden Ukraine from using our weapons to fire into Russia. Russia is using North Korean weapons, Iranian weapons, even for a while, Turkish weapons and other weapons, and they fire into Ukraine from almost 300 degrees on the compass rows. They're firing into Ukraine, and we forbid Ukraine from using our kit to fire back into Russia. You, sir, were, a, were an Army commander. If you were told that you were going to receive fire only and not be able to return fire, I don't think you'd want to work under those, those uh, conditions. I, I, uh, I think uh, my good friend Lloyd Austin, his head would have exploded if he had been told that he couldn't fire back at his enemies when he was the CENTCOM commander. I do believe that if we got our policies right, I... You and I just have to disagree on that. I think Ukraine could pull it off. We have time for one last question. We can reattack. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Reattack. The uh, the sanctions that you you've discussed, eighty percent of the world ignored them, and particularly China, People's Republic of China, and India, two of the largest powers on the planet. Yep. Putin's army has gotten stronger over over time. Uh, with the resources from People's Republic of China and India, uh, Putin 
Putin's economy grew more than the German economy. German economy actually shrunk during this period. Putin's economy ha has grown. Russia is getting stronger. It is not getting weaker as a function of those uh, sanctions that are going on. So when we think about artillery and all the other things that you need to produce weapons, the Russian army is getting better. It's improved over time also. So my, you're, uh, the sanctions again, we're, we're going we're to agree to disagree here on, <laughs> on this. On this thing, I'm good with I, that. I, I, uh, I'm good with that. I, uh, I, I said it a year ago. Uh, Russians will not be defeated here. Now, I'll leave you with that. So just another example of how leaky the sanctions are. If you read uh, uh, two days ago now, the latest discovery of the uh, Russian drones that have been shot down, almost all their guidance package is American avionics. Mm. People are, are getting American electronics out of America and selling it into Russia. You made my point. <laughs> Any last questions? There's one way back there. Right, right over here. One right there too. The hand up. I absolutely uh, appreciate and enjoy uh, counter arguments. I believe iron sharpens iron. Helps me get smarter. Good evening, sir. You you um, mentioned briefly about the loitering munitions, and we've seen these extensively, in, not only in Ukraine, but in the uh, Second Nagorno Karabakh War, uh, specifically like the Shahid 136. Do you see Do you see these as um, an evolution in the warfare, or is this just a more efficient way of filling an already existing role, or how do you see these shaping uh, future warfare? Well, I think they have uh, their uses, but right now the loitering munitions are not having the impact they did three or four months ago because of the electronic warfare environment and the small arms capabilities at shooting them down are, are getting better and better on both sides, on both sides. Um, uh, I asked a group this morning who's the, who's got, who is the best electronic warfare country in the world today. It's Russia. And we in the United States are in, not in the top five. Um, China's got some incredible capabilities. Israel has got some incredible capabilities. We have probably the best technologies in the world, but we haven't fielded them. And other nations have technologies near to ours, and they're fielding them at great rates. So this is something we're going to have to address in our military. And with that, um, I want to close down. I want to, first of all, welcome everybody uh, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. We'll have uh, breakfast uh, at the Bruckmiller Room at the Jayhawk Welcome Center. And then at 9 o'clock, uh, the program will uh, kick off. We'll have three panels. Uh, General Breedlove will uh, uh, start us off again, and that will be uh, on the uh, the war and the global politics aspect of it from uh, 10.30 to 12. We'll have a panel. We'll be looking at environmental security in the war. Uh, we'll, from a comment, uh, uh, one of the topics that General Breedlove talked at uh, uh, 1 o'clock to 2.30, we'll have the war and disinformation. And then finally, from uh, 2.30 to 4 o'clock, uh, we'll have the war and the military and intelligence perspective. Um, I want to close, stop, or just finish up by thanking uh, Audrey Coleman uh, and the Dole Institute for what, what, a, what a great uh, evening. And finally, uh, just a huge round of applause for our guest of honor, General Breedlove. Thank you.